Welcome to Using Occupational Therapy to Optimize Outcomes, a presentation of the Home Health Quality Improvement National Campaign's Underserved Population or UP Network. We're so happy that so many of you have joined us this afternoon to learn more about occupational therapy. During the next hour, we will explain the relationship between daily activities and self-management of chronic conditions. Identify and describe six strategies for using occupational therapy to improve clinical outcomes. And evaluate occupational therapy care plans for relevance to health management and outcomes. You can submit your questions or comments using the chat or Q&A feature in your WebEx player at any time. We'll get to as many questions and comments as time will allow for after today's keynote presentation. We're pleased to offer today's keynote presentation from two nationally rec recognized occupational therapists, Karen Vance and Carol Siebert. Both are very passionate on advancing opportunities for home health care and have been great partners of the HHQI national campaign since phase one started in 2007. Karen Vance has provided clinical and general operations consulting services to home care agencies with BKD Healthcare Group since 2003. Her 35 years of experience in home care began as a practicing registered occupational therapist and moving on to roles as clinical and regulatory manager. In addition to her clinical and management experience, Karen has served on the Missouri Alliance for Home Care Research and Education Foundation Board, the Knock Therapy Advisory Committee, the Technical Expert Panel for the Home Health Quality Improvement National Campaign, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality and Consumer Assessment of Healthcare Provider Systems, and the Joint Commission Home Care Professional and Technical Advisory Committee. Carol Siebert is the principal of the Home Remedy, an occupational therapy practice providing contractual care management and occupational therapy services. Carol has served on the Executive Steering Committee of the Home Health Quality Improvement National Campaign as Vice Chair of the Joint Commission Home Care Professional and Technical Advisory Committee and as Chair of the Knox Therapy Advisory Committee. She worked as a home health occupational therapist for 13 years and currently works with Medicaid and dual eligible patients in community health and care management organizations. Without further ado, it is my great pleasure to introduce Karen Vance and Carol Siebert. Thank you, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> Assuming everybody's reached afternoon by now, maybe not. We are pleased to be with you this afternoon, and um, the objectives have already been read, uh, read to you, but the most important things we want you to understand today as we talk about using occupational therapy to optimize outcomes is asking you to kind of think a little differently in terms of occupational therapy, how you use the service, what you expect from it, and bring to your attention that when you think of occupational therapy, and oftentimes you think of occupational therapy in terms of activities of daily living, that daily activities and routines are a critical aspect of self-management of chronic conditions. And chronic conditions is going to be a large portion of the topic today. Appropriate occupational therapy plans of care contribute to improving self-management regardless of the diagnosis. Think in terms of all of the issues you deal with with the patients that you see in home health. <clears throat> so many of the diagnoses are chronic conditions and many of the things you need to affect or impact on a patient with a chronic condition um, are very much the same regardless of what the diagnosis is. So we want to start by asking some questions for you. What types of treatments do you typically see in your OT plans of care? Do you see a lot of upper extremity strengthening, fine motor coordination, activities of daily living? The second question is, what do you 
respect for your OT. Probably a more important question is what kinds of outcomes do you typically get from, from an OT plan of care? And, and also, are you even able to tell whether or not an occupational therapy plan of care is indeed affecting or improving your outcomes? Lastly, and most importantly, what kinds of outcomes do you really need from your occupational therapist and occupational therapy assistant? In the next slide, and it's going to be a very, um, very familiar graph when we take a look at the outcome indicators that indeed you will see when you go on to home health compare. And this is just simply a sample of, of any state compared to the national. But there are a number of outcome measures that very obviously you could draw a connection between what you already think about occupational therapy and the kinds of outcomes that you might be needing in your patients in your home health agency. Pardon me. Of course, I didn't start coughing until I started talking. <clears throat> but take a look at these outcome measures. How often patients get better at walking or moving around? How often patients got better at getting in and out of bed? How often patients got better at bathing? How often patients have less pain when moving around? How often patients' breathing improved? Now, in any one of those, one would and should expect to see the kinds of interventions in an occupational therapy plan of care that you could draw a direct connection to these particular outcomes. But how often and how many times do you actually see that? <clears throat> I will tell you in my experience in getting to talk to a lot of occupational therapists across the nation, it's not uncommon when I'm interviewing them to find one or two say things like, well, you know, there are a lot of patients that are in home health that just aren't appropriate for rehab or occupational therapy or therapy in general. I find that a little interesting because it almost sounds as though taking that kind of approach implies that it's the job of the patient to be appropriate for us as opposed to us finding appropriate interventions for those particular patients. If you look at the next slide, we've got a list of the most common primary home health diagnoses that um, this is a table from 2010, and you may think that that seems like it's old data, but anytime you are grabbing data off of a very large uh, national database, the data in it are going to be, it's going to take a while to be able to accumulate uh, data in a whole national database. And so if you were to go on any website, um, oftentimes the most recent data that they're going to have for you are at least a couple of years old, if not longer. But this list, this table of diagnoses that are the most commonly seen diagnoses in home health haven't changed a lot from year to year anyway. So take a look at these, and they're going to be very familiar to you diabetes, essential hypertension, heart failure, chronic ulcers, skin, osteoarthrosis, and related diagnoses, as well as cardiac uh, dysrhythmias and, and conditions. So these six diagnoses here make up 37.6% of all the diagnoses, primary diagnoses, we see in home health. It's probably also not a huge um, change or difference in other healthcare related settings as well, but we do see a lot of the older population in home health as well as these chronic conditions. And so the question I ask myself as well as these therapists that I talk to that think <clears throat> they are looking for patients with some kind of orthopedic condition, musculoskeletal, neuromuscular, 
and those are the kind of the patients that they are going to get on science care for and will know, are missing a huge opportunity to really have some kind of an effect on the agency's outcomes when they don't recognize what can be done for patients with these diagnoses or any patient with a chronic condition. What does it take to manage chronic conditions? Management of chronic conditions is probably the single biggest topic right now um, in our healthcare industry because it is creating a huge expense in our uh, healthcare system. But think in terms of the fact that as much as 90% of the management of a chronic condition, and you can change the slide at this point, as much as 90% of the management of a chronic condition must be performed not by the healthcare provider, but by the person who has the condition. Patients with chronic conditions self-manage their illness. This fact is inescapable. Each day, patients decide what they're going to eat, whether they will exercise, and to what extent they will consume prescribed medication. I like to ask people when, <clears throat> when I am working with them in the field if they know of any patients they have that actually are self-managing, thinking that what I am asking is are they independent in being able to do everything. And that's not what self-management means. The really interesting part about it is every single one of your patients is self-managing right now, whether you like it or not. The question is, are they self-managing in as effective manner as possible? Because ask yourself, what are we really expecting out of these patients? When we think in terms of managing chronic conditions, self-management as a goal, our role is supporting that self-management. And we have to change the way we are thinking in terms of what we're trying to get out of our patients or what we're trying to provide to our patients, when we walk into a patient's home and take a demeanor or an approach that assumes we know it all and the patient knows nothing, that we're going to impart our wisdom and we're going to give unilateral patient education or instruction telling a patient over and over again, this is what you need to do. Think about the fact that Every instruction, and you can change the slide now, but every instruction and every recommendation is prescribing a behavior, not just um, a, a repeated skill, but a behavior that we expect a patient or a caregiver to implement, not just once, but repeatedly, routinely, and often for the rest of his or her life. And I think if indeed we think about it that way, that it's not about us, but it's about the patient, and what can we do to help support them being able to do what they need to be able to do, it changes our approach and it changes some of our own behavior in order to get changed behaviors in our patients. So think about the number of times, um, and you can go ahead and change the, the slide now, but think about the number of times during the course of any given day or week that you document that a patient is non-compliant. Think about what they are non-compliant with. Typically, it's what we told them to do or what the doctors told them to do. So we educate, we instruct, and what do we do when we instruct is what we've been instructed to do in our documentation and say, what is the patient's response to that instruction? So what we want you to think about is don't confuse the patient being able to verbalize understanding or have knowledge with a patient's behavior or implementation of what it is that we've helped them learn. Also, we don't want you to confuse return demonstration or one-time performance with spontaneous, consistent, and routine performance. Now, 
I read these charts every week, and I read these terms every week. And so I know the whole nation is doing it primarily because those people who are instructing how to document well are doing a very good job of changing our whole behavior in order to know what to document. But I have to share with you something I read just this last week, and that was a chart where a uh, patient's primary diagnosis is diabetes, and <clears throat> there was a whole lot of teaching going on. And there was one note in particular where the nurse wrote that um, that she had given a patient directions on the fact that he needs to wear his shoes. And in the note, the nurse quoted the patient who said, yeah, I know you guys tell me that all the time, but I'm not going to wear my shoes. <clears throat> now, we all know patients who either have been that honest or aren't going to wear their shoes and maybe weren't quite so honest with their intent to not do so. But here's what I found very interesting. A little bit later in the note, as the nurse was summing up what skills she had been delivering, she said, so she taught on all of these uh, issues relative to diabetes, and the patient verbalized understanding. Well, there you have it. <laughs> it would take that that meant that everything was good to go. We told the patient, so they must be doing it, right? It's not enough to teach. It's not enough to have unilateral instruction. And it's not enough to just simply document that the patient verbalized understanding or return demonstrated. There is a lot of problem solving when it comes to self-management and patients successfully managing their condition or changing some of their ways of doing things. So let's think in terms of management of conditions. And what does it take? And you can change the slide now. Um, management of chronic conditions includes a number of things, regardless of what the diagnosis is. And go ahead and change the slide one more time. <clears throat> For example, a very, very, very important part of managing chronic conditions, of course, are medications. We know that improper medication management, not taking medications when and how they are supposed to, is uh, a very large reason why patients wind back up in the hospital within a fairly short period of time after leaving the hospital. So when we take a look at being able to manage your medications, how are they able to obtain them? Where are they kept? Uh, what times of day do they need to take them? And where are the medicines in, in relationship to where the patient is at that point in time? Can they take the medications as they are directed? Are they able to get them refilled uh, without a lot of delay or um, a lot of inconvenience? Self-monitoring, we're always asking patients to self-monitor, whether it's um, keeping a, a daily weight chart or blood glucose, et cetera, watching their skin. We're constantly asking them to do that. And the question is, by the time we get back, have they? Do we see evidence uh, whether or not they have been able to do that self-monitoring? Other treatments are very critical, whether it be oxygen or using nebulizers or insulin. Physical activity, both increasing exercise as well as eating in order to get energy to last throughout the entire day. Diet is a whole other issue. Uh, in terms of what people do eat versus what we're asking them to eat, or more importantly, what we're asking them to not eat. You talk about a daily impact on the patient's health of the chronic condition. And then lastly, are they able to attend and participate in healthcare encounters? If indeed they're not feeling well, they have increased fluid, or uh, they don't want to take their Lasix because if they're going to the doctor's office, um, they don't want to catch themselves not being able to get to a bathroom in time. All of those things are a very, very um, real daily management of a chronic condition. But as we go into the next slide, <clears throat> all self-management tasks involve changing lifelong ways of doing things. 
So out of this list that we just got through talking about, the self-management tasks, medication, self-monitoring, all kinds of other treatments, physical activity, diet, and attending and participating in healthcare encounters, think in terms of how we as healthcare deliverers can capitalize on the lifelong ways that patients have been doing things all along. Remember, patients have been self-managing up until the moment we walk into the home for the first time. I think it is probably a very subconscious and uh, common thing for healthcare people to walk into a patient's home and, and without really realizing it, just assume that the patient's life began uh, the minute they walked in the house. But how many times when you are actually doing an assessment of that patient, are you finding out how have they been self-managing? How have they been doing things? And are we capitalizing on either A, some of the things, the way they've been doing them, maybe some of them have been successful. Do we even bother to find out? Are there some of the things that they need to be doing that we shouldn't go in and just automatically change just because we think we have a better idea? In your assessment, are you finding out what kinds of habits and routines the patient does routinely do? Carol tells the story um, of a patient who um, came home with a new medication, and it was the only medication that was taken in the evening, and she had a very difficult time remembering to take that medication. Well, first of all, medication wasn't where she was at, at the time she was supposed to take it. And she didn't have any cues. So Carol worked with her to find out what are the things that you do in the evening that you do absolutely every evening without fail. And the woman uh, replied that she, she reads every evening before she goes to sleep. So with medication put by her bedside and a bottle of water, she increased her success of taking her evening meds significantly because what, we, what Carol did was use this woman's habits and routines um, to her benefit. And this is a large part of what an occupational therapist can do to provide additional um, information to nurses who have done the whole drug regimen review and medication reconciliation that may not have time to really get into a patient's habits and routines on that first visit, but an occupational therapist assessment can help inform a nurse's plan of care when she knows more about how is the patient doing things before we step into their lives. What are their lifelong preferences? What are the familiar ways of doing things that we don't have to change that maybe we can utilize as a part of their new routine. Roles and role-related activities and habits are also very important because it adds meaning to what it is that patients are doing. And the more meaning we can get out of their activities, the greater the chance that these patients will actually follow through. So in think in terms, if indeed we're going to think about Letting a patient tell us about themselves during that initial assessment, can we think in terms of how maybe previously they did have effective management, but it's been disrupted by very new events? So a patient might have been managing very well, but they had a stroke or broke a hip, they've got new medications they didn't have before, maybe they moved, and so Everything that was familiar before is no longer familiar. Uh, change in caregivers. There are emotional stressors that happen all the time, as well as uh, possible cognitive changes. So think about how any of those kinds of events can change the way a person is doing their, what has always been prior to this point during normal activity. They're going to limit or disrupt their ability to self-administer meds or other in-home treatment. If we're thinking about interruptions in routines, ask yourself, what is the biggest interruption 
in a patient's routine who is receiving home health services. Think about it. It's us. These people have had routines for a long time, and now they've got people tracing in and out of their house on a daily basis, and we can't understand why they can't remember to take the medication. Other kinds of things that happen when you have um, a patient with new events is you may get a reduced level of physical activity. It may limit their ability to either obtain foods or their ability to prepare meals consistent with the diet we've asked them to, uh, to, to use. We're constantly asking people about using fresh fruits and vegetables, but yet they're relying on someone else to bring them um, groceries and what they end up getting is primarily canned goods. You know how much, how much sodium is in a can of green beans? I mean, many times they're not even able to get the kinds of food that we've asked them to eat. It may limit their or affect their ability to adequately self-monitor their symptoms. Maybe they can't even get on the scale. And certainly, it can limit uh, their access or participation in healthcare encounters. The next slide has some great um, quotes from the Institute of Medicine. The self-management is defined as tasks that individuals must undertake to live well with one or more chronic conditions. Live well is the operative phrase there. These tasks include having the confidence to deal with medical management, role management, and emotional management of their conditions. So introducing medical management of conditions into a patient's life cannot ignore role and emotional management. So what can occupational therapy address? If we are asking you to think about occupational therapy in a little bit different manner, the next slide is actually a slide from the um, Occupational Therapy Practice Framework from the American Occupational Therapy Association. And there are two aspects to this practice framework, the domain and the process. And the domain of occupational therapy essentially asks the question, with what is occupational therapy concerned? And the answer to that question is, Supporting health and participation in life through engagement in occupational in, in occupation. Excuse me. I bet you wondered um, why occupational therapy is called what it is. Well, here is the explanation to that. Here are the domains that with which we are concerned when we are approaching patients and preparing to assess them and provide a successful intervention to help them manage whatever condition they have. So you've got um, each column gives you broad categories, areas of occupation, and these, <clears throat> these are um, broad scope, uh, a broad scope list within which a patient needs to perform a skill to be able to perform their areas of occupation. And what we oftentimes see in occupational therapy treatment claims is a list of performance skills as opposed to areas of occupation. And the skills themselves don't do anything more than point to a, a larger performance on the part of the patient. Performance patterns, as you can see, um, are very uh, integral to being able to assess a patient and identify the most appropriate occupational therapy plan of care by assessing and identifying their habits, routines, rituals, and roles. And it's very important to consider context and environment. And as we well know in home health, we are treating patients that are inextricably um, sitting in their context. So we can't remove them similar to what people are able to do in um, the hospital from their context. Activity demands and client factors also are domains of occupational therapy and what they consider when they are doing an assessment and developing a plan of care. The next slide is the occupational therapy process. And what that is asking is, what is it that occupational therapists do? And as you can see, similar to what other disciplines do in terms of evaluation, interventions, and, and targeted outcomes, we indeed are 
integrating those three areas by obtaining an occupational profile, which is part of the assessment and an analysis of occupational performance, developing an intervention plan with um, intervention implementation and review, as well as supporting scope and participation in life engagement and occupation. And this is all tied very well together with good collaboration between the practitioner and the client. So that brings us to the big question, and that is, what should an OT evaluation address? And at this point in time, I'm going to hand over the mic, so to speak, to Carol. Okay, thanks, Karen. Um, can we move on to the next, actually, two slides? One more. Thank you. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what we mean when we talk about an occupational profile. Um, while I don't have as much breadth of experience as Karen does in seeing charts from various places around the country, I do know in talking to many OTs working in home care that by and large occupational therapy evaluations, templates or software or whatever, um, tends to have a, a lot of emphasis on some things and not much emphasis on others. So I want to describe um, what we see as, as what ought to be looked at. Um, in an occupational profile, the therapist is really eliciting um, some history, strengths, and needs from the perspective of the patient. Um, then those needs can be needs related to daily performance from both the perspective of the patient and the caregiver. We've all been in situations where a patient is asked how they're managing a particular activity and the patient insists they're doing fine, and the caregiver sitting behind the patient is furiously shaking their head no. So getting that information from both perspectives is helpful. Um, how the patient was doing before and what they mean by before, whether it was before hospitalization um, or before some change in their condition. Sometimes people talk about before and don't make it clear that they're talking about how they did 10 years ago. But when someone's talking about something that we believe is a baseline, to get an idea of when that baseline was. Um, roles and routines. As Karen mentioned earlier, this can be really important because it's not when you think about the population and home health and, and the, um, the prevalence of the different diagnoses that Karen was talking about, this is a population with multiple chronic conditions, and they're used to doing things a certain way. And so if we just look at, well, can this person put on their pants or take a bath or open their pool bottle, that doesn't tell us how they're used to doing things in a way that's habitual and predictable. So roles and routines are important. Roles are important in that because sometimes it's the roles that are important to the person that drive how they spend their time and what they prioritize. If this is a patient who um, declines to take their pain medication when family's visiting because the pain medication makes them drowsy and they want to be more alert to interact, despite the fact that that means their pain is uncontrolled. So knowing about those important roles can help us to understand some of the decisions they've made or why they're maybe doing or not doing things that affect how effective their self-management is. What the patient's priorities are. And then the nice thing about seeing people at home is there can be clues in the environment that indicate problems or risks associated with daily activities. It's certainly not uncommon to go into a home and we know immediately from multiple sensory inputs that a person is having a problem with incontinence. And a lot of times it, that can help to um, raise the question in a way that it doesn't become confrontational or have a person denying they have a problem with incontinence because we know the cues are there so we can ask more about if they're having problems getting to the bathroom in time. Um, the evaluation includes the occupational profile but then analyzing selected aspects of performance. Let's go on to the next slide. In other words, getting some information from the patient and then having the occupational therapist specifically evaluate from based on what they found out from the patient, what needs to be understood more specifically. Um, and I would point out here, my, in my experience, occupational therapy evaluation templates or software are usually very heavy on five basic ADLs and on upper extremity function. And I just want to share real quickly a story of where um, I learned from a patient that that's not always wise. Um, I was evaluating someone and I was checking her upper extremity range of motion and I didn't think I was being real detailed but I wanted to get an idea of how she was doing. And she said, honey, you do know it's my hip I broke. 
And from her perspective, it didn't make sense that I was collecting that information. So recognizing as, as you look at the software or the evaluation forms that your agency might be using, if, if, if the right questions aren't being asked, that's going to drive the occupational therapist clinical reasoning, and as Karen said earlier, the documentation may look good, but it won't necessarily capture the information that's important in looking at how a patient manages on a day-to-day -day basis. Let's talk a little bit about the care plan, and let's move to the next slide. Um, the care plan is really a roadmap that defines the answers to these questions, and I, I like to think of this as a journey. What's the patient going to look like in terms of their health and their daily performance when home health discharges? What are they? What's their trajectory at discharge? In other words, if we look at them three to six months down the road from home from when they're discharged, are they likely to look the same? Are they likely to be continuing to improve? Are they likely to have deteriorated? Will that discharge trajectory be less positive without occupational therapy? Will it be better with occupational therapy? And then specifically, what will occupational therapy contribute to that discharge picture and that trajectory? I would encourage you, this is a great conversation to have with the occupational therapists that are working for you. Because as Karen mentioned earlier, sometimes when occupational therapists come out of settings that are more rehabilitative, where patients are seen primarily for musculoskeletal or neurological conditions, um, they're used to bringing that skill set to home health, but the population receiving home health is a different population. And so these are the kinds of questions that can force your occupational therapist to start translating what's in their head to explaining how, what they're doing or you encouraging them in what they're doing to actually be gearing their evaluations and interventions more in tune with the population that's who home health serves. Let's move on to the next slide. I want to talk a little bit about outcomes. Um, you know, this is a word that wasn't on anybody's radar screen until about 10 years ago, and now we talk about it a lot. But I think an important question to ask from OT, and you can look at this from a care plan, but if you don't get a clear answer from the care plan, to ask the therapist, what will the result of OT intervention be? And particularly, will it be sustainable? There's really two meanings to that word. Is it capable of being sustained, and what are the resources to, to sustain it? And also, will it matter? We're in a resource-limited world. There's a lot of scrutiny of outcomes, and that means we have to shift the metrics from what's possible to what's practical. In other words, are the what are the resources to, re to achieve a result? In other words, what we expect the person to look like at discharge, and what are going to be the resources required to sustain it? It's not enough for your agency for OT to get somebody to where they're able to do a particular activity at a certain level of function if that's not going to be sustainable. So that means, you know, we always hear begin with the end in mind, start thinking about discharge planning. But it also means is this a goal that's reasonable? If it's really not reasonable for a patient to be independent and stay independent, then it may make more sense to target the occupational therapy intervention to the level the person is likely to be able to sustain or sustain with the caregiver support they have, but where their performance will be consistent enough that they can continue at that level and not deteriorate after home health is gone, rather than go for what might look like a better outcome, but one that isn't going to be sustainable without home health being in there forever. Um, let's go to the next slide. I want to talk just a little bit about some perspectives on outcomes um, because when we think about outcomes, it's easy to, we can think of the list of outcomes that are reported on home health compare, but there are different perspectives. Sometimes patients have a different perspective than their caregivers. You know, Medicare has end result outcomes that are reported, but you can also think about the trajectory of an outcome, and I, I use this concept a lot because the outcome is really what is this person going to look like and how will they continue to look when home health is no longer involved. We all know about revolving door patients, and we probably all have our own personal list of names that we've seen many, many times on referrals. But if we really want to move away from revolving door patients, maybe we need to stop and think differently about the outcomes we're trying to achieve with those patients. Are we going for something that's sustainable, that that person and their family and their support system can sustain? 
it may not be as optimal as it could be for another patient. But if we're going for something that's sustainable, we're likely to put our resources into something that actually produces a difference that will, will make a difference for the patient and the caregiver and for staff and the agency as well. Um, let's move on to the next slide. Um, again, these are the outcome indicators that you're all familiar with, and I know Karen reviewed those. So I just put them up here for a second, but I want to sort of translate these because these outcomes are publicly reported because they're important to the needs of the population served by home health. But if we move to the next slide, I would posit to you that really what this comes down to is for patients, for caregivers, and certainly for payers, what they're looking for are interventions that help people stay at home, that reduce their risk at home, that they're able to manage their health and their, and their health needs at home, and that's really what we mean about self-management. Um, interesting to me that that's really what patients and family members have looked for all along, but more and more payers and policymakers are realizing that we, if we achieve those things, they're more cost effective and they achieve better outcomes overall. Let's move to the next slide. I just want to talk a little bit about care plan reasoning, and what I mean by this is what's going on in the heads of your occupational therapy, an occupational therapist or occupational therapy assistant. Um, as we know, because it's required by Medicare, you need objective and measurable goals that are linked to outcomes. Um, and that means meaningful measures of performance in a care plan. Um, that what tends to be used most commonly by occupational therapists is talking about levels of assistance, but that's not necessarily the only way to document that what someone's performance is or how it's changed. So, for instance, if a patient with significant CHS is unable to perform their morning care because they're so fatigued and they become so short of breath, it's reasonable, a reasonable measure and a reasonable change is to say that at baseline, this person takes this long to do this activity and needs this many rests or rates their performance at a certain level of effort. And after intervention, because they're conserving their energy and they've learned how to incorporate those techniques, that it takes a different amount or a lesser amount of time where they're able to do the activity with fewer, with fewer breaks or they're using the breaks more consistently so at the end of the activity, rather than needing a nap, they're able to move on to another activity. Those are all legitimate ways to measure performance and change in performance. It doesn't have to be just how much assistance is given by another person. Let's move on to the next slide. I'm not going to talk about this much in detail, but again, if you really want your occupational therapist to be contributing to the overall agency outcomes, what, this, what I've done here in two columns is basically take the requirements of what's on the 485 and then ask the kinds of questions that you want your occupational therapist asking that address those aspects of the 485. So for instance, when they're writing goals, and we all know that when goals are in software or they're in a template and you can just check, 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 that everybody ends up with lots of goals. But what you want them to ask first is, what's the patient going to look like when they're discharged? What will their performance be like? Can you describe it in ways that mean you or anybody else can look at the patient and determine the goals in that? Um, that's what they need to be thinking first before they commit it to objective and measurable goals. So this slide can be a tool for you in getting your occupational therapist to think a little bit differently about a care plan so that it's easier to link what they're doing to your overall agency outcome. Let's move to the next slide. Um, this is just a reminder, you've probably heard about the GEMO settlement, but it's important and this is new information for all of us, really, in the last year, that improvement or rehab potential is not a criterion for receiving OT. I can't tell you the number of times I've heard somebody say, well, they're not a candidate for OT because they're not going to be able to improve. We've had stabilization measures as part of the OBQI report for 12 years now because Medicare recognized a long time ago that for some patients, stabilization, in other words, not getting worse, is a favorable outcome because otherwise they will deteriorate. 
but the 2013 Jimmo versus Sebelius settlement confirmed that that expectation of improvement can't be a requirement to receive otherwise covered services. So if you have therapists that are saying, well, that person's not a candidate for OT because they're not going to improve, then you need to make them aware of the Jimmo settlement because the real question should be, is occupational therapy going to change the trajectory of this patient in terms of how they're managing daily activities on a, day, on a regular basis? Let's go to the next slide. I'm going to describe three strategies that you want your occupational therapist using. The first is what we think of immediately, face-to-face -face encounters, the home visit, which is also the most expensive use of resources. But there's also two other ways that OT can impact patient's performance. The second is monitoring. You're just checking in with the patient by phone in between visits so that when they go to do that next visit, they don't go out and find out that the patient hasn't been doing what they needed to do. Or if a family member says, yes, I'm going to get that bathtub bench, if the bathtub bench isn't there the next time the OT comes, then that ends up meaning a less than optimal use of that next visit. And the third that's related is homework. I do not use the word home program or home exercise program because much of what our patients have to do is not home exercise, but just simply practicing skills that are being taught by the therapist. Um, and making it clear to a patient that if they're going to if they're going to reach therapy goals or the goals that they agreed to with the therapist, that that means that what they do when therapy is not there is just as important as what happens when therapy is there. So it sets an expectation for patients that their activities in between visits are just as important as the visits themselves. The other, and this goes back to what Karen pointed out earlier, is the difference between isolated or habitual performance. There's a difference between teaching people skills and building habits. And if care plans are focused on teaching new skills but not looking at how they become incorporated into regular routines, they're not really going to change patient's performance, and it's not, they're not going to support self-management. So for instance, most patients don't need to learn how to cook. But if you have a patient who's on a, a diet where they really have, their sodium is significantly restricted, what is important is not to teach them to cook, but to, to work out ways for them to be able to manage preparation of their meals so that they're adhering to those sodium restrictions and not using all their energy to be able to manage those meals. So for instance, we see patients all the time that are on sodium restriction, and because their energy is limited and they get short of breath, their family members go out and get the microwave meals that are full of sodium. Well, that solves the energy problem, but exacerbates the sodium problem. So that patient doesn't need to learn how to cook, but that's where occupational therapy can work with that patient to find a balance between what their energy is going to allow them to do to prepare the meal, and balancing that out with what's available for them in terms of prepared meals or frozen meals or what others are doing, so that they're meeting their dietary needs, and at the same time, they're actually able to manage the task. Let's move on to the next slide. Um, these are just some examples. Um, that Karen mentioned earlier of intervention and coordination with nursing about aid care plans. Um, instruction from other disciplines being integrated into performance and routines by OT. Um, working on spontaneous and consistent performance. We all talk about teach back, but really, ultimately, the most important teach back was when a patient is doing what we've instructed them and they're doing it on a regular basis. And then using aid services as an opportunity to practice in between occupational therapy visits so that a patient can refine their performance. Um, it doesn't take, if it doesn't take a skilled occupational therapist or occupational therapy assistant, then we shouldn't be using OT for practice when an unskilled person can do the practice. Let's move on to the next slide. I just want to identify real quickly six strategies for using OT to improve outcomes. Managing medication routines, integrating dietary recommendations, conserving energy as a lifestyle, incorporating physical activity into daily routines, self-monitoring as lifestyle, and problem solving to reduce hospitalization risk. Um, what I'm really going to emphasize is medication management, and you heard that a little bit from Karen as well. If we could move to the next slide. I'm not talking about occupational therapists teaching medication. 
What I am talking about is the actual activity of managing medication, of this administering the medication, of storing it, of recognizing that refills have to be obtained and getting those refills in a timely fashion. That's really an IADL, and I would posit it's the most important IADL. And so this isn't about OT getting into outside of their scope and teaching medication or dispensing medication. It's about looking at the actual task of taking medication and looking at how we optimize the patient being able to do that on a day in and day out basis. I would posit to you that we have some patients where even if they're, they don't know their medications well, and I'm not saying that's a great thing, but if they're taking it regularly, that's really the ultimate goal. And sometimes we get distracted and get so focused on teaching the medication that we lose track of are they actually taking it in, a way, in the way it's ordered so that it's actually having an impact on their health. If we move to the next slide, I mentioned in an example just a few minutes ago about dietary adherence. But again, it's not about skills or teaching these skills. It's about what the patient's existing skills and habits are and how do we tweak those things so that they can incorporate the dietary recommendations that are made for their particular condition or condition. On the next slide, I've elaborated a little bit more about conserving energy as lifestyle. We have patients, you know, I saw somebody yesterday who thought taking his oxygen off was a way to exercise his lungs and didn't appreciate that that meant that he had an oxygen saturation of 82. When we're working with people that have heart failure or COPD or other conditions where energy is a big issue, a lot of times it means working with patients so that they find a balance in their activity so they're not overdoing things and they learn to recognize and read their body so that they're able to do things that they need to do and not get exhausted in the process to get themselves into real significant jeopardy with their health, but also to learn how to use controlled breathing, use relaxation techniques, or use a pulse oximeter if they have one, so they're able to self-monitor. On the next slide, I've discussed a little bit about physical activity. I've certainly worked with lots of people where their biggest physical activity is getting up and walking across the room to the television because the remote control isn't working. But finding that balance of physical activity to keep that can be important in managing their condition. And then finally, on the next slide, self-monitoring is lifestyle. We think of all these things that we ask patients to do that are self-monitoring, their blood pressure, their blood glucose, their skin, their weight, and integrating that as part of daily routine. Um, Karen gave the example of the gentleman who said that he wasn't going to wear his shoes. To me, the immediate next question for that is, can he put on his shoes? Because a lot of times that's the part that the patient doesn't mention. I spend a lot of time with people figuring out how they're going to weigh themselves, particularly if they've had an amputation or they don't have a scale or they don't have good balance to step, step on the scale. But those things have to be worked out if they're actually going to manage daily weight. I think the last part is just problem solving, giving patients opportunities to problem solve. Well, what, what happens if you get up in the morning and you discover that you, your weight is up three pounds? What do you do next? And actually walking them through those scenarios as part of their daily routine. So it's not just I'm weighing myself because the nurse says I have to, but helping them to understand, well, if that weight is different, what's the next thing that you do? Again, to make that part of their daily routine. So I'm going to stop, I think, at this point because we've got some questions and I've gone a little bit too long. But we've also included a couple of handouts that describe what I've just talked about specifically. Um, one of them has to do with diabetes management and the other is on chronic conditions in general. And those are available as tools for you as well as for your occupational therapist. Thank you so much, Carol. Uh, we do have a little bit of time for questions and answers, and we have a question right now in the queue that came in a little earlier in the presentation that asks, do you recommend any feasible standardized measures such as QOLs or patient activation inventories to measure results? Um, I, I think if there, if there are available within the resources of the agency, they can be really helpful. Um, for two reasons. First of all, because they are widely recognized measures and they give you a way to report results that are understandable to other individuals and other aspects of the healthcare system. Um, and the second way is because they, they also help to focus everyone on the team more on the issue of what's the patient's role 
in this and what's their investment in this because we do get so focused sometimes on what we're doing that we don't always capture how invested the patient is. Another question in our queue asks, can occupational therapy collect OASIS data at any time subsequent to the start of care? Yes. Um, that was actually clarified by CMS about a year and a half ago. There is no requirement anywhere in the Code of Federal Regulations that requires any particular discipline for the time points after the start of care. So our recommendation would be the person either who has a scheduled visit closest to the designated time point or the, the discipline that has had the most contact with the patient and can, re, and can handle the questions most efficiently during that visit. And we have time for one final question before today's wrap-up, and it asks, can an occupational therapist supervise the home health aide when nursing services are not on the plan of care but occupational therapy is on the plan? Yes, and I'm going to give a citation. The answer to that is in the conditions of participation. It's 42 CFR 484.36, and those are exactly the circumstances. When nursing is involved, nursing must supervise the aide on the plan of care but the language says that when nursing is not involved, the appropriate therapy discipline, and that it doesn't say what the appropriate therapy discipline is, but the appropriate therapy discipline can supervise the aid and supervise the plan of care. And I would posit that for the kinds of things usually addressed by the aid, occupational therapy would be appropriate. The one caveat with that is you need to check your state laws. The one state I know of offhand is Maine that requires no matter whether nursing is in or not, nursing has to supervise the aid. So there's no prohibition of that from Medicare regulations, but you do want to check and make sure that your state permits that. And we'll squeeze in one more question that came in at the last moment, but I'll let you know if you have additional questions, you can email them to hhqi at wvmi.org, and we'll make sure that we pass those along to today's keynote presenter. Final question asks, do you have any insight as to when or if occupational therapy will become a qualifying skill in home health? Um, boy, wouldn't we like that? Um, I, I'm not optimistic about it ever happening. And the reason for that is it has nothing to do with occupational therapy. It has to do with the fact that it would be considered an expansion of a Medicare benefit. And in the environment that we're in politically right now and the med and Medicare costs in general, um, it would be very difficult to convince legislators to do something that would be an expansion of the Medicare benefit. There has been some legislation that would give agencies more flexibility for OT to be able to conduct the start of care, and that was introduced as recently as the last Congress, but right now anything that has to do with Medicare is kind of tied up in a knot on Capitol Hill. But um, we would certainly like to see that happen, but it has more to do with the political environment and the economic environment right now in terms of that ever happening. Thank you so much, Carol, and please pass along our appreciation to Karen as well for her great sure. presentation a little earlier today. We'd like to wrap things up by pointing out some Home Health Quality Improvement National Campaign resources that support the topic we discussed today. Please make sure and check out our Focus Best Practice Intervention Package on Patient Self-Management that contains four concepts of patient self-management, individual motivation, patient activation, and action planning. And most of our best practice intervention packages include self-management principles. So make sure and visit homehealthquality.org to have access to those packages today. Also on our website, we've posted resources from today's um, networking webinar. Uh, just go to the Up tab at homehealthquality.org. You'll find PowerPoint handouts and also occupational therapy's role in home health and occupational therapy's role in diabetes self-management. It's all available on our website now. Uh, you can also check out webinar archives that include evidence-based health coaching, the newest trend in patient engagement, this well-attended one-hour webinar is archived on our website and features Melinda Huffman, co-founder of the National Society of Health Coaches. Our next underserved populations networking event will be Wednesday, May 14th from 3 to 4 Eastern. We'll be talking about best practices for care transitions engaging emergency departments and urgent care centers. And our guest speaker will be Rebecca Gardner, 
senior medical scientist of health centric advisors and assistant professor of medicine at the Albert School of Medicine at Brown University. Reserve your spot before they all fill up now at homehealthquality.org slash up. Last of all, we have another webinar coming up on Tuesday, April 29th. This is the Gravity of Falls Evidence-Based Preventive Strategies. Seats are almost full for this one, so if you haven't reserved your spot yet, make sure and visit homehealthquality.org so you can participate in that free nationwide webinar broadcast next Tuesday from 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern. You see links on the page here if you'd like to connect with us. We have a multi-platform of different connection tools throughout the HHQI national campaign, all accessible at homehealthquality.org. Again, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate your participation, the great questions, and a special thank you to our keynote presenters as well. Have a great day. Thank you.